And it is indeed, uh, I think, a quite different take on what constitutionalism might be meaning in the transnational uh, sphere uh, from what we've heard both in uh, uh, the speaker before me and in Gunther Teubner's uh, approach, although there are also some overlapping elements, I think. Um, but it is in a way more um, strictly looking at the European context. And in certain ways I'm trying to make claims um, that we cannot indeed, as some scholars like Andrew Arato have uh, uh, argued, we can't leave the law to the judges and to the lawyers. We have to uh, uh, show and analyze how the law matters beyond the text, beyond the courtroom, etc. Uh, and so what I try to do here is to look at um, processes of post-national constitutionalization um, particularly within the European context, and in a certain way, again, becoming a little bit narrow, perhaps, in a, in a statist approach, looking indeed at uh, regimes within the European context that I, I guess you could, could see as kind of transnational versions of what we understand by political constitutional law. Um, and what I try to do here is a number of things. Um, there's a normative attempt uh, to think about how the emergence of, let's say, a European constitutional order or constitutional orders uh, can be increasingly become also uh, more related to processes of sovereignty uh, uh, formation, of political will formation, hence democratic participation of citizens in some kind. Um, it's also an attempt to develop what I see as a political sociology of constitutions, uh, which tries to look at a whole bunch of different actors, in, indeed including uh, uh, civil society actors, NGOs that were mentioned before, uh, what I think Gunther Teutner calls like the sort of spontaneous forces, <laughs> I've always liked that uh, particular description. Um, and then thirdly also what I would like to do, but which is still fairly underdeveloped because I simply haven't had yet the chance to sit on this in a proper way as a, as, a, as, a, as a researcher, a number of cases. If I have the time, but it will be very uh, short, I will mention two cases. One of them is the so-called water movement or the right to water movement, which I think is a very interesting example of bottom-up societal <coughs> engagement with uh, rights, but also with what I would see as a more kind of alternative in some ways, constitutional project uh, for the European situation. Um, and where does this all come from? Well, first of all, um, I have a strong interest in what I would like to call, and what is called in a way in the Italian context, constitutional resistance. That is, particular forces in societies uh, standing up to certain formal or more formal political and legal processes of constitutionalization. Um, I secondly also have a strong interest in processes of what I would want to call participatory constitutionalism and hence in the past I've been doing a lot of work on well, the Italian constitutional reform recently, the failed reform project, uh, the Icelandic case which is extremely interesting but now sort of imploded you might say, uh, the Irish case, uh, there's also in Romania there have been examples of uh, citizen engagement with deliberation on, on constitutional reform. So that's another aspect I find extremely interesting. Um, thirdly then, there's also the dimension of a kind of critical approach to liberal constitutionalism. And so you will also see if I get to it uh, for time reasons, that I believe we should shift away from a strong emphasis merely on the idea of liberal constitutionalism, or actually I like to, I tend to prefer the notion of legal constitutionalism as the only way of thinking about constitutionalism, which seems to me fairly ahistorical and apolitical at the same time. Um, and then fourthly, I'm also simply um, concerned. I believe that the European Union is necessary but at the same time, I see strong indications that it might not last very long. And so one of the reasons I'm looking at some of the uh, transnational social movements in Europe and the constitutional dimensions of their acts and their claims, etc., is because I think we might learn something about potential uh, uh, future uh, uh, 
designs of a different type of European order. So briefly what I will try to do is I give you a couple of premises of what I think is not yet being done and what we should be doing from a more sociological perspective to emerging constitutionalism within the European context. Um, then I will say very briefly, um, I will make a claim that I feel we should widen our attention in terms of forms of legal and constitutional mobilization. I feel that current literature is somewhat too strictly focused on things like litigation. Then I will say a couple of things about what indeed I call a political sociology of constitutional mobilization. Um, then I will come indeed to what I briefly already referred to as a plurality, I believe, of constitutional rationalities. Um, and I will take it a little bit too far, perhaps, uh, by mixing this idea with, with approaches in sociology, like, for instance, the approach by Luc Boltanski, Laurent Thévenot, uh, who claim that you can think uh, about orders of justification based on different higher principles with all the same high level as higher principles. And if you apply that to constitutionalism, you get constitutionalisms, which I feel uh, is an important insight by looking at the contestation over the emerging constitutional order uh, within the European context. Um, of course, I will not be able to do all this because I have uh, 20 minutes at most. Um, but let me very briefly then say a couple of things about why I think this is necessary. There is an emerging, emerging literature, uh, particularly from American, North American scholars, on processes of litigation in Europe, particularly, of course, focusing on the European Court of Human Rights, but is also interested in, 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 in the European uh, Court of Justice itself. Um, I feel that in that literature, most of the times, uh, there's too much merely focus on what I would see as a kind of instrumental rationality of engaging in litigation, in looking at concrete cases and rights violations, etc. There's fairly little attention for how, in some cases at least, there might be more larger projects with particular constitutional dimensions to them, uh, which are not merely about specific cases, but that are about uh, larger, let's say, political constitutional projects uh, to be realized in the future. Um, and so, in my approach, I try to broaden up the scope of attention by looking at forms of mobilization, by looking at societal, civil societal engagement with the law, with rights, with constitutional matters, and by looking at other types of actions they might be engaging in. And this is the cultural dimension to what I'm doing. I've been doing this in many different contexts, um, where it's more an emphasis on the, well, you've used the term narratives. Uh, perhaps I would use the term discourses, different constitutional discourses, and particularly different substantive claims, which I feel are often based on different higher principles and hence different constitutional re rationalities. And so, as indeed my colleague uh, Chris Thornhill has labeled it, apparently what I'm doing is conflict theory. Um, and the deeper basis behind what I'm uh, presuming is indeed that constitutions are always contestable and they're actually always contested. Uh, and hence, uh, we see an ongoing struggle uh, about what constitutions are, but also about what constitutionalism is, I feel. Um, so hence, I look at, in this particular case, at movements, at social movements of different kinds, um, who are, are not only engaging with the law for instrumental reasons, for strategic reasons, but also for value reasons, I would say. Um, and I'm equally, as I already said, interested in what does this mean in terms of a constitutional order being co-created, not only by political forces and particularly by legal forces, but equally indeed by societal uh, forces at that. Um, and so I feel that in general, in this slowly emerging literature, there's a lot of attention for litigation, which is fine, because there isn't any structural, systematic insight in what has been going on, I guess, uh, so far. But I feel we could also as we sometimes read explicitly, but most of the time more implicitly in this type of often political science and legal uh, literature, could also look at other uh, types of engagement with the law, 
that indeed social movements engage with, but of which we actually have very little understanding. And it might not lead to anything, the actual implications and in institutional outcomes of particular actor actions by social movements might not add up to anything structurally, uh, but already the question uh, itself of why do they do this? Why does Varoufakis want so much to have a constituent assembly for the European Union? And that's why he calls his movement DM25, because that, then it's when it's going to happen, according to him. Why does he do that? What does this tell us about the particular in the status and the understanding and the meaning given to what constitutionalism means, in this case, indeed, within the European context? So I'm particularly interested in mobilization, constitutional mobilization, and claims making in all kinds of different fora. And that's exactly what my project then is supposed to be doing within uh, looking at the media, but also looking at uh, all kinds of other situations in which public claims are being made. And the third element should also be including, of course, direct engagement with the institutions. Of course, social movements not only make claims in the media uh, or in public fora, but they also go knock on doors uh, of European institutions or they organize events uh, with the European Parliament, etc. Uh, which also needs, I think, to be taken into account as a part of this story as, uh, well, in this case, again, a kind of material constitution, uh, an actual uh, constitutional dimension in practice, you might say. Um, so, well, how do I try to do this? Well, there's a whole bunch of different literatures on which I try to, uh, um, uh, from which I, I try to borrow. Of course, there's a whole debate about sociological constitutionalism, but if one thing strikes me from the book I edited with Thornhill is that there's a huge variety in which you can do this. Um, that is one source of inspiration. Another source of inspiration is the American debate on what used to be called populist constitutionalism, but that's now a very dangerous term to use, apparently. So it's popular constitutionalism, uh, taking the constitution away from the courts, as Kashner <coughs> called it, uh, the people themselves, uh, as Larry Kramer called it. That's another dimension I find important here. And it's not really being used within the European context, in certain ways for obvious reasons, because European legal system works in very different ways and also national legal systems. But I think there's increasingly uh, a need for similar types of approaches that have normative dimensions, but they're also simply analytically looking at what is the relation between social movements with different civil society actors and specific claims and specific types of <coughs> mobilization and legal action. Um, I also relate it to a more theoretical debate, and I've been, you didn't mention that, but um, another paper I recently published um, is about uh, constitutional imaginaries mm -hmm. and how um, I feel at least that constitutions are ultimately taking their meaning from imaginaries that have become, let's say, predominant in forming our meaning in times of modernity, so to speak. Um, and so there I also draw on work of people like uh, uh, Hauke Brunkhorst, who himself then draws on Koskenyemi, for instance, with uh, the idea of constitutional mindsets, which I find a very, uh, very rich idea. They use two of them, I think, why two? Why not six or seven? I think you could pluralize it further. Or perhaps you could think about it in more hierarchical terms with two imaginaries and then you get different <coughs> translations of that and different types of uh, claims and arguments and, 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 and uh, understandings. Um, and so how Brunkhorst and others inform me in a more pluralistic debate, of course, also Gunther Teutner has talked in the past about different legal rationalities, uh, but I try to make it more sociological in a way by dragging in uh, particularly Luc Boltanski and Laurent Thévenot, who could be in certain ways even be seen as a kind of sociological application of the work of people like Michael Walzer and his spheres of justice. The idea that modern societies are not based on one or two higher principles, but actually there are more. Um, another element I borrow from Boltanski and Tevenot, which I find highly useful, is the idea of tests. So if we have a plurality 
of understandings of what constitutions are, if we have a plurality of higher principles behind those understandings, uh, then claims being made, for instance, by social movements on existing constitutional orders can be understood as tests. Tests in a double meaning, at least in French, as a preuve, as a test, but also as a challenge, as actually m perhaps a way of making the existing order uh, collapse, uh, implode, or whatever. Uh, and they identified, particularly Boltanski, a test of truth, which is basically a reproduction, a ritual of the existing order, a test of reality, where it's basically said, well, the higher principle is fine, but our practices are starting to diverge from the higher principle. We need to go back to realizing the actual higher principle that we set out to uh, institutionalize. And then finally, the most interesting one, I think, is a test of existentiality, where actually they said, no, it's actually no good what we did. Um, if I have a second, I will give a couple of examples of some social movements indeed saying ultimately this, I think, in the European context and uh, European constitutional context. Um, and so these different tests are one means of looking at different types of claims and their actual sort of uh, status with regard to the emerging constitutional order or orders, uh, uh, whatever you want to uh, emphasize here, in, uh, in, indeed in the European context. Um, and so I do this particularly because I believe, again, in the literature on litigation, but I think also in a lot of other approaches to the law, that there's too much emphasis on an, an instrumental rationality. The value rationality or rationalities are not uh, taken sufficiently on board. Uh, you could also translate this into a different uh, understanding of the law, that is, as either being a vehicle for order as I indeed try to argue in my piece on constitutional imaginaries, or uh, a vehicle for emancipation, for change, for uh, changing things around. Um, and that's exactly the approach that I try to, to take in this perspective. But it means, of course, that uh, if that's the case, then indeed every existing legal order is always open for contestation. There can always be, if there's an instituted right, it can also be used, always u be used against itself. We're saying actually it could be built out further, inclusion could be expanded, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and an important story then becomes, I feel, in the current times of crisis and post-crisis, indeed, uh, if we have different rationalities, if we have different uh, constitutional rationalities, uh, what is then the current situation? And to what extent indeed are we seeing an imperialistic situation in which um, one or perhaps even two rationalities are dominant over the other rationalities? Uh, and I think I heard a lot of that. I'm not going to uh, play on this further, but I heard a lot of that in the president of the uh, Court uh, of Justice of the European Union yesterday, where I think there was a bit, perhaps too much talk about market principles, governance, uh, and that type of argument. And that's exactly what some of these social movements are claiming against. Um, and so this is a very initial, incomplete attempt to think about these constitutional pluralities of plural constitutional narratives, whatever you want to call it. The ones I was, ju was just talking about is indeed legal constitutionalism, where the idea is it's about stability, the rule of law, legality. These are the notions. Um, but the second one could indeed be an economic constitutionalism, what Stephen Gill and others have called new constitutionalism, where it's not really stability, well, that's also important, but it's actually market stability. And the higher principle, ultimately, is, of course, something like material wealth. Um, the third one we know very well as well is where politics is up front, a political or republican constitutionalism where the ultimate higher principle is popular sovereignty. Um, but we could go on, and there are manifestations in different societies in Europe, basically societies where my time gets sucked into nowadays because I'm writing on populism, they do a lot of the communitarian 
constitutionalism, where it's the identity that uh, plays up. I don't see this so much on the transnational level, by the way, but for instance, in many different societies in Europe, this is becoming increasingly a kind of critical voice, like in my own country, where the European Court of Human Rights is seen as invasive and destroying Dutch democracy and so on and so forth. Um, to further <coughs> constitutional narratives, um, social justice, <coughs> which is equally important for the analysis of social movements and their claim within the European context. And then finally, environmental considerations. And I actually would like to broaden this up and link this, I think it was already mentioned a number of times, to the notion of the commons or common goods or public goods as a key element uh, behind uh, constitutional orders. Um, so, well, as I said, this is non-exhaustive. It's not yet robustly elaborate. This is just a train of thought sort of briefly nailed down on a slide. But um, um, what can we then do with this in actual uh, empirical analysis. Well, one way we could use this is indeed looking at different movements and their specific claims. And I feel one very rich example is, as you might know, the first, well, you will know because Germany was extremely important in this process, the first successful European citizens initiative, uh, the Right to Water initiative, that was one of the first started up in 2012, and in 2013, it got almost two million uh, signatures. Um, and well, that process is, is interesting in its own right, but I'll leave that to social movement studies. What I feel interesting is the, the different types of claims being made by this movement uh, that are not merely about what I call this test of reality. That is, um, as they, as you can see, it also an example here. Um, the normality is public systems of water services. That's the normality according to this movement. And the thrust in European legislation as well as in nat national legislation like in Italy I lifted on my own skin almost with Berlusconi indeed adopting uh, uh, a legislative act to privatize uh, water services. Uh, they basically say uh, we should go back to the status quo ex ante. It should become public again and the European law should clearly stipulate this. Well this is one part of the claims being made here. Uh, there is already a little, some constitutional dimension there, of course, but there are other dimensions in the claims being made within this movement that go much further. Uh, and that indeed tap into um, the idea of human right to water, uh, but even further, there is sometimes an implicit and sometimes an explicit critique, like in the uh, work of Hugo Matei, uh, that Gunther knows well, uh, uh, as well, of course, the, the right on radical, in some cases even very aggressive, as in the case of Matei, attack on liberal constitutionalism as enshrining the notion of private property, which is at the basis of all the misery we are in, basically. Um, and so there you see a much more radical test indeed the test of existentiality uh, that is going on. Indeed, one would also then need to see what happened then to this and what are the real life implications and are there actually changes in the law, etc. Uh, but for now, I think this is already fairly interesting to see how these movements engage indeed with the uh, European constitutional dimension. Um, and so, you see attempts at the legal redefinition of water as public or common uh, and you see a different model, as they have done in other fora and other uh, uh, ways, like, for instance, their manifesto on the commons, uh, another future for, an, in this case, one might argue, an economic constitution for the European project, uh, with a very different view of how to deal at least with some public goods in a kind of Polanyan sense, water being a fictitious commodity that needs to be re-embedded because it can be fictitious because that's ultimately destructive. Um, and finally, I was too lazy to translate this. Another example that I've been working on in different cases now, and I'm also going to look at it from the populist lens, so from a very different perspective, is in the DiEM25. And here you see a statement from its local branch in Naples, the Italian branch of last week, I think it was, 
uh, where they basically make even stronger the whole idea of organizing a constituent assembly for a European political constitution indeed, where they say indeed we feel that we first should be voting on whether citizens that actually want this in a transnational kind of public arena. Uh, and so this is a very different story, but it's also in certain ways wedded to some of these other claims we just saw in the water movement. Um, and indeed, for me, one of the main questions still remains why this constitutional language? Where does this come from? Why, why is this seen as a relevant, and I guess in certain ways also practical strategy? Because otherwise, why would you put so much effort into this? Um, I will stop here because otherwise we really don't have time anymore for any uh, reflections. <laughs>